But my whole heart is we all need guides through this life. I don't know about you. I don't ever want to make a decision on my own. I want the guide of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is saying to us. Man, you're going to have trials. There's going to be things out there that try to destroy your life. You better listen to the Spirit because it's the Spirit that's going to guide you. You can't and know. And why is he saying that? Because the Spirit is familiar and knows how to solve the problem that we have. Yep. The word says to desire the things that are from God, to renew our mind and bring those things to him because the world cannot know the things that God has for us. And so there's a revelation knowledge that comes with the spirit that brings us to a deeper place. What it really is openly to you is the power of God desires to bless you, but if you only know the flesh, and you become so familiar only with the flesh after you're born again, what happens is you lock the blessings of God out because the blessings of God are not found in the flesh, they're found in the spirit, and then they manifest themselves into the flesh. But a lot of people are trying to solve their problems through the natural mind or the natural man. How many of you know that those problems can't be solved? This is why Jesus, really, when he spoke to Nicodemus about spiritual things, Nicodemus was a man of God. He was a priest of the royal priesthood of Hebrew and was spent his time in the temple studying the word. But he came to Jesus and John and he said, basically, I want what you have. I desire to accept what you're giving. And this is what Jesus said to him. He said, to have what I have, you must be born again. And there again, hearing those words, I'm sure maybe we would even think that if we heard them for the first time. And a lot of people, that is foreign to them because they're in their flesh. This is what Nicodemus said. Nicodemus said, how can a man when he is old enter his mother's womb again and be born? And Jesus said back to him the very key that we need to understand. He said, that which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. Now, what was he really saying? How many of you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior in here? Raise your hand. I want you, the word says, He confesses me before men, him also will I confess before my Father who is in heaven. So that's kind of a confession. You're saying you love God, you know Jesus Christ, or you desire to know Jesus Christ. That's powerful. That's anointing. But I mean, that's just the beginning. Amen. That's not the end of the story. Because when he said... To Nicodemus, that which is born of flesh, he recognizes, he gave us a capsule form to be able to live in this atmosphere that we live in now. So that if we cut, or we are cut, he automatically put into our body uh, an immune system that would attack that cut, coagulate, cause a scab, so the healing would begin. How many of you know he did the same thing in the spirit? He gave us spiritual things in our life, a natural spiritual awareness in our heart and in our spirit that when things go wrong in our life, we're not going to answer them through the natural means. We are going to have to look into the spirit and just like if we're cut or hurt or disappointed or let down, how many of you know the spirit then can go to that and begin that healing? Amen. Just like the natural body does. Amen. But if we don't know that, then what we try to do is solve spiritual problems with natural means. And that's where most of the body of Christ is. They're like Nicodemus. Well, how can a man, when they are old, enter his mother's womb? I don't understand this teaching. Well, I want to tell you, it should be very aware to you because of the power of what Jesus did on the cross for us what he did on the resurrection for us. Yeah. But listen to me very carefully. Unless you desire after or hunger after spiritual things, just because you're born again doesn't mean they'll come to you. You have to desire them. Because look at what this says right here. 
These things we also speak, not with the words of men's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual. John says this in 6, 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. How many of you want life in here? Amen. I mean, I, you know, in fact, Christ came to give us life, and the Word says, give it to us more abundantly. Yes. Everybody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. I like abundance. I mean, you know, it's funny. I, I mean, you know, the, the bigger the plate is, and the more food they pile on it, in America, how many of you know, we really love that restaurant. <laughs> Come on, church. I mean, it's like, wow, did you see those portions? We're going back there. I could only eat half and threw it away, but I still like that. How many of you know you have to have that same hunger and desire? The word says, they that hunger. Yes. Amen. How many of you know the, that they're really the portions God's trying to give out is a lot bigger than we can even handle most of the time? But a lot of times we don't recognize that because what begins to happen is we're so connected to the natural realm when the spirit really is trying to speak or heal something up or develop something in our life because that natural mind gets in the way. You know, I, I, I'm just, I'm just going to take a little side trip here. I wonder how our thinking would be if we were never connected or shackled to sin. Have you ever thought of that? You know, how you think about God? You know, you never were shackled with sin and didn't know about, you know, if Adam hadn't fell. I mean, you know, how would our mind work? I think it would work a little different than it does now. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> because, and, and that's really why God sent Jesus to break that slavery mindset to where we didn't have to sacrifice to him, we didn't have to do all these things, so that we can enter into the spirit of God and the presence of God whenever we desire. And the power of that is, really, slaves never renew their mind or have a hard time with spiritual things. It's kind of like the Israelite slaves, really. That's why they couldn't possess the promised land. And a lot of people have a hard time possessing their promised land spiritually because they still have a slave mindset. In fact, I heard a story one time. I'll share it here. I think it fits. Uh, an African-American pastor in America that had a very large church, he was going to New York to speak at a conference. and So he caught a cab from the airport to his hotel. And when he did, there was a Nigerian pastor, or a Nigerian man, that was driving the cab. So there were two African-American men in the same cab. And, and they got to striking up a conversation. And the pastor got very bold and he said, you know, I've never cared for Nigerians. And the Nigerian said, well, why? And he said, well, you guys seem to really be arrogant. And uh, the Nigerian said back to him, he said, he turned around, stopped the cab and said, well, you know, one of the reasons why we feel like that is because like you, we've never been a slave. <laughs> he said, you're thinking and your insecurities come most of the time because you've been a slave. How many of you know, how would we feel if we had never been a slave? And I'm not talking about prideful arrogance. I'm talking about we would walk with our head up instead of our head down. We would realize that we're part of the head and not the tail. Come on, church, are you out there? Because see, so often we walk in a way on how we think and what we're connected to. If you're connected to the Spirit, this tells me the Spirit gives life. Somebody that has life isn't looking down and weary every morning when they get up. Somebody that has life, when their feet hit the floor, they're ready to live it at its fullest. And that's not always easy to do, but that's what the Spirit is trying to get us into to recognize that we don't have to be beneath, but we are above. We don't have to run with to recognize that power. That is only found by the Spirit of God coming into our life. And if we do not desire that, it doesn't just happen because we're born again. You have to desire spiritual things. You have to hunger. You have to thirst. And they that are hungry will be quenched. They that are, will be filled. They that thirst, that thirst will be quenched. 
He didn't say your thirst would be quenched if you weren't thirsty. There's something we've got to do to walk like that. Come on, church. And when we walk like that, what we don't understand is our life becomes so much fuller and so much anointed and so much blessing comes into our life. Because when we are only connected with the flesh, even though our spirit is born again, we're like Nicodemus. We're saying, well, can a man, you know, can these things change? I've been connected to these things all my life. I want to tell you they can change in the twinkling of an eye. They can change in the name of Jesus Christ. But if we don't know that, and a lot of that is not taught, because I think sometimes the enemy, and listen, I know you love God, I know you care, but the power of the Spirit is only found, because after he said this, the word that I speak to you are spirit and life. So where does life come from? The spirit. It doesn't come out of the natural mind. It doesn't come out of the natural things that come into your life. Real life comes from God himself, that spirit that dwells in us. Then it says in the next verse, this is powerful, but the natural man does not receive them for they are the spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. You know, how many of you would like to give the devil a heart attack? I mean, just blow his absolute, or a stroke, just blow his mind. Do you know how that would, would do you know how that would happen? Everybody say, I love pastor. Because I'm going to say something to you that really, and just tap your neighbor and say, they've already received the offering, just relax. You know what would give the devil a heart attack? If a church was 100% tithers. Yes. That would literally give the devil a heart attack. Because there would be no lack financially to do whatever that body wanted to do. Now I don't say that to put you in a guilt trip. But what I am saying to you is this. You wouldn't have problem with that if your mind was renewed. The problem comes from that slave mindset. Well... I better not give it away. I might not get more tomorrow. Well, I better not tithe. You know, I really can't afford that. You really can't not afford that. Because you robbed the blessing. Thank you for those amens. But, but what I'm saying to you, see, if you were never a slave, if you didn't really deal with the flesh, believe me, your spirit isn't say, I don't want you to give. Because to really connect with God, that's the only way you really can connect with God. For God so loved the world that what? Yeah. Oh, wow. God's a giver and I'm supposed to have his nature? That's right. Come on. <laughs> All right, mind. Come on, charge. I mean, see, people would never have a problem with that if it wasn't part of that sin that had been in our life. Now we came to God, but we brought some baggage with us. Come on. And we got to unload the suitcase, church. Amen. I mean, tap your neighbor and say, unload the suitcase. Unload the suitcase. Now I say this because it's foolishness to give 10% of your money away to the world. But to us that rock in the spirit, it makes perfect sense. Why? Because it's all God's. Yep. I don't see what I have is 10% of it God, 10% of it me. He's the master of it all. Come on. Yeah. Or he's the master of none. He doesn't take second place in our life in anything. Amen. He is either first or second. And it depends on what position we put him in, how he ministers to us. Good. good preaching, Pastor. Hallelujah. Thank you. Good preaching. Hallelujah. I know, you, I know you're wrapping your mind around this, but, but listen to me. This is where the problem lies, is because we brought that sin nature with us into this walk, and some of us haven't left Egypt. We're born again, but we haven't really left Egypt, and so we can't possess our promised land, because all we see is the giants in the land. You know, it's an amazing thing. They brought back a clump of grapes that they had to carry. One clump, that's one cluster that they had to carry between two men with a pole. 
And the men that carried that back said, we can't possess the land because there's giants in that land. They didn't see what God had promised them, the blessing that was on the other side of the Jordan. All they could see was Egypt. As long as we see Egypt, we will never walk in the flesh. We rob ourselves. Come on, church. And now listen to this, because this is so powerful. It goes on to say, For those there is foolishness to him, nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Everybody say discerned. discerned. Now the word discern means to have revelation of it. To be aware of it. If you're going to walk in the spirit life, you're going to have to desire it. And you're going to have to be aware of it. And part of the problem is we have a hard time remembering. It's kind of like putting the righteousness of God on every day. How many, maybe the way I can explain, I explained in the first service like this. How many of you know when you woke up this morning, you're not wearing the same clothes you did when you hit the floor? Well, let me try that over here. Maybe you did over there. You were not wearing the same clothes, correct? Okay, so what did you have to do to put clothes on? No. You had to make a decision what you were going to wear. That's a decision. That's discernment. Now where the problem lies is if you're like Pastor Sandy, and I love you, and this is not a bad problem, but this is what she says to me some Sunday. She goes, do you remember what I wore last week? <laughs> and I've kind of tried to learn over the years because for years I would say, I don't even remember what I wore. <laughs> how am I going to remember what you wore? <laughs> how many of you know that's how we are really a lot of times with the spiritual armor of God? I mean, you've got to be, you've got to make some decisions in your life to renew your mind, to walk in the spirit, to what you're going to put on every day, what you're going to let in your mind, what you're going to let in your heart. You're going to have to, because it isn't God making the, he's already given us the spirit, but we got to make some decisions. Everybody say responsibility. So I mean, you know, how many of you, I really believe this is so funny because how many of you know that a lot of people want to put something on that impresses or at least helps someone say, you look good? Anybody not want that in here? Do you wear the ugliest clothes you can so somebody will say, man, that shirt is ugly. <laughs> no, we try to, in reality, we try to put something on or like <clears throat> Pastor Sandy said to me this morning, so I'll wear this shirt often. She goes, man, that really goes with your blue eyes and blonde hair. <laughs> How many of you know that deserves a kiss? Amen. Come on, church. <laughs> I mean, we really want to impress people. I don't mean that bad, but we want things that look good that are going to at least people are going to be drawn to. Or maybe we'll wear shirts like Turning Point. We want people to know that we're involved. We want to help their life. We want to bring them out of the troubles that life brings into their life. And, we want, and so we wear that shirt to advertise that, to say, I care about you. It's not just about in the shirt, it's also about other people. But every one of us, every morning when we get up, we make those kinds of decisions. Do we do that spiritually? We should. That's what God's trying to get us to. When our heat, I'll tell you right now, when my feet hit the floor every morning, this is what I say. God, prepare me by the Spirit. Whatever comes into my life, I'll be able to handle it with your heart. Because how many of you know, everything that happens isn't going to be good. Bad things happen to good people. And challenge things happen to good people that are doing right and trying to even live by the Spirit. But you really don't know what you're made of until you walk through it. Does it crush your life or do you crush it? Come on, church. I mean, we really don't know our spirituality. We can come to church and worship and we can say, man, I wish we had church every day because I feel so good on Sunday. Well, how many of you know there's also Monday or through Saturday? You know, it's called life. Yeah. And where was the Spirit found in life? He found the Spirit through life because 
The spirit wasn't foreign to him, but it was a natural part of his life. Everybody say natural. natural. And then, let, let me read this. John 16, 13, 15. However, when he, the spirit of truth, everybody say, where's truth found? It's found in truth. It's not going to be found anywhere else but in the spirit. The world doesn't know the truth. Nor can they know it. So if you're looking for the world to solve your problem. If instead of, how many of you know instead of sometimes calling sister Susie and telling her about a problem. You got down on your knees and prayed to God. And listened to what the spirit said to you. Because you know, Sister Susie's great, but she can't solve your problem. God can solve your problem. And let me tell you this openly. I love you, but it's true. So now Sister Susie has your problem, and she can't solve it. So what, all, all she can do is talk about it. But when God talks, how many of you know it's a lot different than Sister Susie? Come on, church. Um, really this is where we live and I'm not saying to not have good people in your life people you need to count on people you can share things with but listen have you got down on your knees first and prayed right. have you listened for, have you asked for the ear of God and like John 10 says my sheep know my voice and no other voice will they follow not even sister Susie's <laughs> all sister Susie can do is confirm what God is saying but God wants to just say God wants to speak to me and so look at this. Has come. He will guide you into all truths. How many of you don't know really by yourself how to walk through this life? I'm a hunter. I love to hunt. And I've been places where I had never been before. How many of you know to hunt you really need to be normally familiar with the territory you're going or the ground you're going to cover. You'll have more success if you're familiar with that. Okay, I live in California. I want to hunt in Idaho. I go to Idaho quite regularly. But guess what? I go with the guy that lives there. What does he do? He helps me find the critter I'm hunting. One year I was up there, I was on my quad, they dropped me off. I was making this drive through this clearing, it got really cold. So I went back to my quad and I rode on up the thing. How many of you know I wasn't hunting wolves? How many of you know wolves aren't in, well there's been a couple in California the last year. But they reinduce wolves up there about 12, 15 years ago. I'm sitting there overlooking this canyon on my quad, having a cup of coffee, and all of a sudden I hear this wolf call down below me. If you've ever heard a wolf go, ooh, ooh, I mean, the back of my I mean, it was almost like reality. And that bothered me. But that didn't bother me until I heard another one call from the other side of me. How many of you know I started my quad and went back where I was even though I didn't see anybody. But my whole heart is we all need guides through this life. I don't know about you, I don't ever want to make a decision on my own. I want the guide of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this is saying to us. Man, you're going to have trials. There's going to be things out there that try to destroy your life. You better listen to the Spirit because it's a Spirit that's going to guide you. You can't and know. And why is he saying that? Because the Spirit is familiar and knows how to solve the problem that we have. He solved them before. How many of you know there is nothing new really under the sun? The newness is, it happened to you. <laughs> the newness is, it happened to you, and you've never had to cope with this before. But how many of you know, God has had to cope with it before? Wouldn't we rather call on Him? Are you out there? And so, let's kind of deal with this. But whatever he hears, he will speak and will tell you the things to come. Anybody want to know your future? Yeah. It only comes by truth in the spirit. It can't come by your natural mind. For he will of what give you what is of mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has given to me or mine, 
Therefore I say that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Everybody say, I'm a receiver. I'm a receiver. I mean, he is going to declare things when my spirit is receptive to his spirit. Everybody say receptive. receptive. Now tap your neighbor and say, I think he's talking to us. Just tell him that. Because we are so sometimes unfamiliar with that. And then let me close with this, really, or these two scriptures, because this is very quick. I'm do this quickly, but you've got to catch this. But he is spirit. He who is spiritual judges all things. Yet him himself is righteous, judged by no one. Do you know, I've had people take that so much out of context. Let's, let's break this down. But he who is spiritual judges all things. He didn't say he who was born again. This is where most people misunderstand. If you're doing things in the flesh and you think God is not going to judge that, you are absolutely off your rocker. Come on. If you do, there is a sowing and reaping in life. But see, oh, there's, there's no judgment on me because I'm born again. He did not say just because you were born. He said he who was spiritual is not judged. So if you make the wrong decision in the flesh, that's probably going to be exposed and not work out. Because I've had people take the scripture and say, see, nobody should be judging me. I'm born again. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with that. How many of you know, just tap your neighbor and say, I think he's talking to me now. <laughs> that you can make silly decisions even though you're born again. <laughs> if you make the decision by the flesh. Burn yeah, good preaching, brother. And I mean, that's, I don't understand how people pull that from this when it's so clear because the very next thing says, yet he himself is righteously judged by no one. Who is? The one that makes spiritual decisions, not natural decisions. Even this scripture in Romans 8, 1. There is there therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Wow, I'm never going to be judged. God's there just to just pat me on the back no matter what I'm doing in life. I mean, even that is not what that's saying either. Because <laughs> look at the very next part of this verse. Are you out there? You love me enough to receive this because this is really what we need. We think because we're born again, these things don't happen. No, they don't happen because you are led by the Spirit, not because you're born again. And this is why so many people still have that slave mindset and are still in Egypt and they can't possess the promised land because they think they've arrived because they got born again. How many of you know there are decisions we've got to make? There are choices we've got to make? We've got to put the clothing on every day. We've got to let God lead our life. We've got to be knowing that our steps are ordered by the Lord and not by luck or chance or circumstance. And when we know that, the power of God works in us. Because look at this. He's saying, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh. He didn't say anybody. He said, he that doesn't walk, that is led. You know, the early church, when, we study the, when I study the early church in my own time, it's just amazing to me. I mean, it's a blessing to me. Because... They were young. They didn't have the Bible we have. They had a book that Paul wrote to them in the epistles. They didn't have the Bible we have. But they were so spiritual conscious. That blesses my heart. Because that's what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a spiritual place, not a natural place. And I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against the spiritual things. He didn't say things wouldn't try to come in. But if we handle, oh, I'm pre come on church. I love you so much. If you would recognize this and get this in your life, I want to tell you it's revolutionary for most people. Amen. It's hardly ever taught. Because people can't handle that. Because it puts a responsibility on my choices. It puts a responsibility on do I want to renew my mind. And look at this, it's so clear 
They that do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What about walking? So in other words, when we walk by the flesh, this is what I wrote down. So when we walk by the flesh and we do not renew our minds, we cut off ourselves from the blessing of God's presence. Because he's present in the spirit. He's not present in the flesh. We feel it in the flesh and it affects the flesh. But this is what I said. But when we walk by the spirit and we have a spiritual mindset, we open ourselves up to the fullness that God has for us. And that's what the enemy is trying to fight us. He doesn't want us to walk in this. Why? Because the blessings of God are contained there. It's the vessels that we can really recognize and see. Now let me close with this because this is important. Here's where we're going to pick up next week anyway. Verse 16. He who knows the mind of the Lord that he may be instructed. Everybody say instructed. instructed. Wow. So in other words, to have the mind of the Lord, I've got to be teachable. I've got to be the student, not the teacher. I'm preaching good now. You know where I'm going, right? Because a person that can't be instructed can never renew their mind. Because construction or instruction is good for us. I'll show you that next week in Proverbs. The book of wisdom just talks about, in fact, I'll just share this with you. It says, never instruct a slother, for he will hate you. But instruct a wise man, and he will, re he will receive instruction and become wiser. Yes. You know, nobody likes to tell us things that are going to hurt our feelings. But how many of you know sometimes God uses people to instruct us? Yeah. I had something happen last week, and we'll pick up here next week, but I had something happen last week, and it's true. Um, you know, I do a lot of stuff outside just preaching. I lead groups here in our church and, and train leaders, and one of the leaders really came to me and said, you know, Pastor, I, I, I really think sometimes in our meeting I have something I want to say, but because there's a lot of strong personalities there, and you're one of them, you know, I can't get a word in edgewise. Okay. Now, how many of you know I could have got mad? I could have said... Well, how dare you? I'm the pastor. I need to be leading this group. But really what they said was absolutely right. I sat there in my chair. They shared that with me. And I went, you're right. Because this person has a lot to share. There's a lot in them. And so I met again this week. And I said, do you have anything you need to share with us before we leave today? Because I received instruction from somebody. Now, I mean, my flesh doesn't love to hear stuff like that. But guess what? It was right. Yeah. Sometimes we can dominate and, and it can be in a good way. It can even be for a godly thing. But how many of you know the other person might have something to say that's going to revolutionize right. our life? That's right. If it's one thing I can honestly say about Pastor Sandy and myself, I've always been teachable. And I always want to learn more. And I want to be a better leader. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to be a better grandfather. And sometimes God uses people to do that. But if I'm not willing to be instructed, I can't have the mind of Christ. And so that means pride, arrogance, selfishness, opinionated people have a very hard time with that. Because they always think they're right. They always need the last word. Come on, church. Have you ever been in a room where... It, it's funny how guys are. I mean, you know, I, I love it. But it is funny sometimes. I go hang around. I go fishing or hunting with guys. And Have you ever noticed that somebody else has got to top your story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember. You know, and I do it too. Because what they're saying... Everybody look at me very carefully. Because what we're going to get on next week, I want to tell you, will revolutionize your life. Because I'm going to be talking about how you renew your mind. 
But if you don't recognize that there's rebellion, there's selfishness, there's a lot of those things in our life that stops us from renewing our mind and we're not being able to be instructed. How many of you know it's pretty hard to renew your mind? Yes. It's almost impossible. And the reason I say that is because if we've always, a lot of times, even when I'm talking to people, and I have learned, you know, uh, I mean, I read books, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I've read a lot of books about people because, you know, I'm in the people business. I mean, it isn't about a church building. It's about people. And, you know, it says things like, look people in the eye. Listen to what they're saying. You know why it says that? Because it explains it. It says when you look in their eye, you listen differently. If they're talking and you're looking away, and I, I have a hard time because I'm not dyslexic, but to be very honest, I mean, I'm, my mind never shuts down hardly. I mean, you know, I'm just always constantly. In fact, I have some new things coming up here in another month that some of you are going to be blown away with because we're taking on another thing. And it's going to take some energy to get that done. And the last thing I need, I mean, I was talking to a pastor this this week and he's younger than I am and and he said I don't know what kind of battery God gave you <laughs> literally this is what he said I don't know what kind of battery God gave you he said he didn't give me that same battery I don't get it he, he said yeah, uh, you know you're so much older than I am I said thank you very much <laughs> but church when you have that spirit leading you it it I mean this, what I do is not work. What I do is anointing and when you live on the anointing, you live differently. The anointing doesn't wear out. The calling is without reproach. Just because you even step out of pulpit ministry, you never shut down in ministry. And some of you have that on your life. But you're operating in it in the spirit. You want to minister and touch other people, but you do it out of your own energy. Start doing it out of the anointing. The anointing carries a different weight. God's yoked up with us. His burdens are light. Well, this new thing's going to be a burden on me. No, it isn't. That's that's really canceling the power of the word. The word said the burden is light. When is it light? When we do it in the spirit. Yeah. It's heavy. And we got to carry it if it's in the flesh. Yeah. I'm preaching good here. Come on now. I'm getting ready to close down. But my heart is this. Because I want you to be prepared. I want you to read Hebrews 12. The chapter. And Romans 12. To prepare for next week. Because the word says, do not be transformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. So I say constantly, your mind is the problem. It's not the circumstance or situation or really even your past history. Now a lot of people have to get their minds straightened out about their past history. But the problem is in the mind. It's not really even in the flesh. But I want to tell you, the word says, if you're going to be transformed, the only way you can do it is through the Spirit. Yeah. Do not be conformed to the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And when you renew your mind, how many of you know, I hope somebody doesn't mind me sharing this, but somebody shared with me last week, they had a problem with cancer, and it went away. Because when you renew your mind, a lot of that is in confession. A lot of that is, what do you say about things? How do you speak? And they said that they went to the doctor, they drew blood, and it came back. And their uh, PST or whatever it is was really good. Um, and they said, you know, we've been in the church now a while. And the only thing I can think of that I'm doing differently is I'm talking differently. How many of you know that's pretty powerful? <laughs> Whatever's going on in your life, you want it to change? Change the way you're talking. 
Because when you change, see out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And this lie that has came to the body of Christ is, you know, words don't have any power. Words don't hurt anybody. Yeah. And I'll close with a funny story and then pray for you. Because years ago, I've, I've, I've about taught the renewing the mind about four or five times. I remember when, I've heard, when I first heard it in the last 30 years. I've taught it probably four or five times. Well, I went back and retooled and added some stuff that I think I've learned in the last few years. Because it was probably six or seven years ago since I taught it. And... Um, when I was a young man and we were starting the church, we had a small church, and it was, it was funny because they, uh, I, I taught on this and taught about confession. And so what we did, the church was real small, we gave everybody a quart jar. And we told them, we said, now when you say a negative thing, put a quarter in that jar. And then every Sunday, we would bring the quarter, the, some of you might remember, I think Joanne was here then and Mike and we would have a big jar up here on each side and they would come in every Sunday and during worship they'd come in and pour their whatever their quarters were or whatever and it was so funny because we had this girl that got saved in the church her and her husband Freddie and she was a redhead man young in her early 20s had a couple kids but she was a redhead man and she had the fireball of a redhead and she played the saxophone in our band for a while and it was really cool to see them grow but I noticed, uh, I used to sit right here in the front row, and I noticed when she came up that morning to practice with the band, she dumped her jar in there, and there was a $5 bill. <laughs> and so after service, we were out in the foyer, and I remember I said to her, I said, I noticed you dumped a $5 bill in there this morning. And she goes, oh, pastor, I'm really ashamed. I said, what are you talking about? And she said, Freddie made me so mad, I put five dollars in there so I could say whatever I wanted. <laughs> How many of you know that's life? Everybody say five dollars. <laughs> Come on church, I'm sorry, but it's, I know I'm kind of leaving you on a light note, but you need to understand your words do have power.